course representing PW Perspective, which who better to talk about perspective <laughs> than someone with your history and all of that. So first of all, just again, let us know who you are, how long you've been in the area. Let, let the people know a little bit about who you are. Well, my name is Albert Williams. My full name is Albert Joseph Williams. And I got that name from uh, Albert Joseph. Uh, I got my first spanking from a uh, little short white Italian guy named Alfred Joseph mm. from Lazo. Mm. So he, uh, he delivered me back in 1941. And his name was Alfred, Alfred Joseph from Lazo. But he told my mother, he said, you know, he wanted her to name me Albert oh. Joseph. So I'm named after him in a way. So I told Prince William County Board of Supervisors oh, quite a few years ago, I said, I don't guess he's my father, because, but we didn't have DNA back then in 1941, did we? We sure didn't. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, he, he was a very well-respected man amongst um, the blacks at that time. Yeah. You know? Everybody liked him. And in fact, he's, he, uh, he was my family doctor. Wow. Uh, um, but, and I was brought up here, in, uh, right here in Prince William County. Went to school up here at Jenny Dean. Um, when I went to Jenny Dean High School, it was well. When Jenny Dean first founded that founded that school, she called it Manassas Industrial School, and she wanted a school where blacks could learn a trade like cosmetology, barbering, uh, shop, uh, home economics. You know, she wanted uh, blacks to have some type of trade. And uh, so, but when I started going there, it was they changed the name from Manassas Industrial School to Manassas Regional School, and then, and that's when I started there. It was called Manassas Regional School. But when I graduated, 1961, uh, it was called Jenny Dean High School. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so after I graduated, I had a <coughs> I had a four-year scholarship to Virginia State College, and. Um, I didn't want to go no further south than Prince William County. <laughs> and uh, this was during the Jim Crow days, you know, the Jim Crow era. But I didn't take advantage of that scholarship, so I went to Howard. Okay. I had to, even though I had to pay my own way, you know. Mm -hmm. But I, I didn't graduate from Howard. I went to Howard for one year. And I was taking like 18 credits, which was, you know, full time. Mm -hmm. And then at night I was working at FHA which is the uh, Federal Housing Administration, as a janitor. Mm -hmm. And working as a janitor eight hours during, during the night and then going to school for a time, it was rough. <laughs> it was really, really rough. So what happened was that uh, after I finished one year and um, I decided to go into the military. But getting back to Howard University, I was living with my aunt at that time. Uh, my aunt and, uh, in Washington, D.C., who was a very, very good friend of Eleanor Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. She and Eleanor Roosevelt were very, very good friends. But uh, uh, I, after I quit Howard, I, uh, I moved back to Virginia for a few months, and then uh, I heard about a march. Uh, there was going to be a big march in Washington, D.C. in 1963. Mm -hmm. So uh, I joined the NAACP at that time. I think I was about 21 or 22. And I joined the NAACP, and the, the man that was in charge of Prince William County NAACP was Mr. Russell, James Russell, very nice man, wonderful man. And uh, I called, I got in touch with him and told him, when he picked me up, I want to go to that march. So I spent the night before making my little black and white sign, mm -hmm. you know, freedom now, freedom now. And every time I see black and white images of that march, I said, I'm in that crowd somewhere. I'm out there. <laughs> I got a sign that says freedom now, you know. Right. And, um, <clears throat> but that was, a, that was a fascinating experience. I remember it was over 100 degrees that night. I mean, that day, rather. And what happened was that uh, there were so many people. I and mean, we got there about 10 o'clock that morning, me, Mr. Russell, and there was another gentleman in the, in the, in the van. And, we, and Mr. Russell was driving a van. Mm. And, uh, we got to the march with so many people, we found a parking space, and the crowd, there was one young white girl, I guess she looked like she was about 
maybe 20, 19 or 20 or something like that, very young girl. She had passed out because of the heat. Oh, wow. And what happened, me and Mr. Russell and the, other, and the other gentleman and a bunch of other people, we held our hands up like that, real high, right, to pass the, the young white girl that had suffered from heat exhaustion because it was so hot. So we passed her over to the paramedics. You know? Wow. And, uh, but that was on August the 20, August the 20, 20, uh, 23, August 23, 1968. Yeah. Wow. And um, I'll never forget that moment. And then my Hilda Jackson got up there and sung, uh, <laughs> Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. The crowd just went crazy. Wow. Oh, it was an amazing moment. And that was in August, August 23rd. And then I, uh, after the march, I said, gee, I got to do something with my life. I want to go back to school. You know, mm -hmm. I said, it doesn't matter. I said, but I really can't afford it right now. So August, September, October, August, September, October, November. In November, I said, well, I'm going to go into the military. So I went into the Army in the military. In fact, I went into the Army the same week that JFK, President JFK, was assassinated. Oh, wow. That same week. And I remember I had a 1957 Ford. And when I heard that um, President Kennedy had been assassinated, I pulled my car over to the side and I just laid my head down on the steering wheel. Mm. But um, that week I went into the military. Wow. I, and then I, and I stayed in the military. I had two years of active duty and four years of inactive duty. So during the inactive duty, I spent it in New York. But I came back here in November of 1965, you know, from the military. That was November of 65, and then in 1966. January of 1966, I had $95 in my pocket, and I said, I don't want to stay here in Virginia. I'm getting out of here. I packed my little duffel bag from the Army, Wow. and I um, caught a Greyhound bus from Woodbridge to New York. I had $95 in my pocket. I didn't know the difference in Brooklyn, Bronx, Queens, Long Island. Staten Island, I thought it was all just New York City. <laughs> so when I got to Port Authority, the main bus terminal there in New York City, mm. I put my duffel bag and I had a little shopping bag. I put it in the 25 cent locker. Wow. And I walked from midnight until about 5 o'clock in, in the morning trying to find a place to stay. So I finally found a place on 90, 95th Street and Riverside Drive. Yeah, 95th or 94th Street, Riverside Drive. And it's about 5 o'clock in the morning. And um, I saw a sign in the window that said, Rooms for, for Rent. So I went inside the hotel there, and a little short German lady, red hair. I said, oh, I understand you have rooms for, for rent. She said, yes, we do. Uh, you looking for a room? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, well, they're $13 a night. I said, well, I'll take it. She said, oh, OK. Oh, you look just like Sammy Davis Jr. I said, no, ma'am. I said, I'm not Sammy Davis Jr., you know? My hair was black, by the way. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not Sammy Davis Jr. But she was a very kind, very kind woman. She really yes. was. I said, well, I, my stuff is down, downtown at Port Authority, you know, in the locker. I said, well, I have to go down there to bring my, to get, bring my stuff back here to the room. So I went back downtown. I think I, I, didn't, I couldn't walk because I had blisters on the bottom of my feet from mm. walking from 42nd Street to 94th Street. So, and uh, we're, you know, near, near Broadway. So uh, I went down and got my stuff and came back. And uh, the little small room it was so small, it was like a little, it was almost indescribable. <laughs> <laughs> and roaches were there everywhere. Oh you know? my goodness. So anyhow, so the next day, I went, um, next day I went out, uh, the, uh, the next day I went out, a couple of days later, no, this next day I went out looking for a job. And I first place I went to was First National City Bank. Today it's called City Bank. Mm. But in fact, I was speaking to someone at City Bank today, and she said, oh, Mr. Williams, you've been with us almost 50 years. I said, yeah, I used to work for you when you were known as First National City Bank. Wow. So uh, I got a job working there. I said, I'm going to stay there the rest of the year because I saw an ad in the uh, New York Times. And uh, the ad said that the Federal Reserve Bank was looking for coin counters, people to, to run the machine to count the coin. And I had that experience when, uh, when I left Howard. 
I got a job working at Alexandria National Bank in Alexandria, Virginia, you know, running one of those corn machines, you know, the machine that spits out the corn into the uh, bags to send to the different, different federal air banks. Mm -hmm. So we now, so I asked my supervisor at first, not to the bank, I said, could I have an extended lunch hour? I got to have something to do. So she said, yes. So I jumped on the subway, uh, New York we call them subways, I think in Washington they call them metro, but in New York we call them subway. Right. But anyhow, I jumped on the subway, went downtown to the Federal Reserve Bank, and filled out an application, and uh, took a physical exam, a written exam. So they, they said, okay, uh, Mr. Reed, we'll be in touch with you. And the whole two days later, they called me and asked me, when could I start working? I said, I can start next week. <laughs> so I started working. And I ended up with 33 years of service with, uh, with the Federal Reserve. Wow, wow. And I'm going to inter interject for a moment. Yeah, I'm sorry. Because just, I don't no, know it's, I talk. love it. I, I don't even want to interject because it's so <laughs> enjoyable. But I know when we even first met, one of the things you shared was your history just in acting and movies and all of that. So I believe, if I'm not mistaken, you've appeared in over a hundred? Yeah, over a hundred movies. Back, if, if they ever give out an award for a person with most <laughs> credit or, or who had done the most work, on yes. extra work yes. in the movie, yes. I'm guarantee you I would take the prize. <laughs> you know? Well, tell us some of the highlights that, that you've had with that. Well, I, in, my, in my manuscript, which uh, I'm hoping to get published real soon, uh, in my manuscript called Beyond Kanky Hill, uh, there's a chapter called Show Business. Mm -hmm. And in that chapter, I talk about um, my working with uh, famous people like the late George C. Scott. Mm -hmm. He did a movie called Hospital. Mm -hmm. a real tall guy. But he's been dead for many years now. Some of the older people that's older than you, you, you know, <laughs> and our videologists here. <laughs> you know, but, uh, and then I worked with Red Fox um, on a movie called Cotton Comes to Harlem. Mm. And I did background work again. But Red Fox was such a funny guy, off screen too. He was so funny, really very funny. <laughs> and I talk about how I, when I met him, we had a break. We, we, had, we took a break, about like 10, 15 minute break from that movie Cotton Comes to Harlem. Mm -hmm. And he was in this limousine, he had taken his shirt off. so. He, and uh, on his nipple, he had made it look like a, somebody's face, and he and he and when he breathed, it, the no, the nipple would move. You know, everybody just cracked up laughing. You know? And here it is like 102 degrees out here, you know. <laughs> and he was in the back of his limo, you know. But he was amazing, an amazing, you know? mm. and amazing man. You know? yes. Then there's the, uh, then I had a, I had a speaking part in a movie called Coming, Coming to America with Eddie Murphy. Mm -hmm. And I, there's a scene just before Samuel Jackson come in there to start shooting up the place. There's a scene where I'm sitting at the table with a little kid that's playing my son. And I had some, I had dialogue with Eddie Murphy. Mm -hmm. But when they edited the, the movie, they took the dialogue out. I was so disappointed. Yes. That, you know? <laughs> so uh, you can see me, if you blink your eye, you'll miss me. But you can see me <laughs> sitting at the table with the little kid that's playing my son. Uh, yes. But Eddie Murphy is a wonderful guy. Wonderful guy. Mm -hmm. then, there, then there's Whoopi Goldberg. I worked with her on a couple of things. She's my, she's, oh my God, I love her. I love Mr. Whippy Goldberg. I love her so. Uh, we used to work. I worked on all my children, a TV soap opera, for many, many years, so for at least seven years. The background work again. Mm -hmm. And uh, her studio, I think her studio was either Studio A and my studio was Studio B, you know, where I did all my children. And I would pass her in the hallways, you know. Mm -hmm. And I would say, Good morning, Miss Johnson. Because her, her real name is Karen Johnson. She would say, Oh, shut up. Shut up. Shut up. She's just <laughs> funny off stage as she is on stage. You know, I love her. And I remember the first, first time I ever saw her, I saw her at, uh, in Washington Square Park in, down in the village. Mm -hmm. uh, she was out there telling jokes. And she had a, a hat or something on the ground asking people to put money in the container on the ground, right? She said, you all better put some money in there because otherwise one day you're going to pay a lot of money to see me. Wow. And lo and behold, she got a one woman show on Broadway. I think Mike Nicholson's in that director. Wow. And uh, she went from that step on, she went on to star. Wow. Wow. There's so many other. Then a couple of years, oh, I, um, a couple of years ago, 
Steve, Steve Spielberg did a movie called uh, Lincoln with Daniel Day Lewis and yes. Sally Fields. Yes. And I had an audition for a part in that. And I, I think I went back to, it was down in Richmond, Virginia. I think I went down, at, I had two callbacks, I think, but I got the part, right? It was a nice speaking part. They sent me the script, I learned my dialogue and everything, you know. So one night we were shooting the scene, I guess about 50 or 60 some of our actors, and, and it was that night. And it was very dark outside, and so anyhow, so, uh, so uh, the, the, the scene called for me to interact with uh, Mr. Lincoln, you know, Daniel Day Lewis. So I did, and uh, so during the break time, Mr. Uh, Mr. Steven Spielberg got everybody together, you know, 50 or 60 some actors or whatever, you know, He's, he called us all together. He said, oh, yeah, everybody, you did a wonderful job, wonderful job, fantastic job. He said, and he came over and I said, I'm Steven Spielberg, and I knew who he was. So I, I said, yeah, I'm Albert Green. He said, he said, everybody, I want to tell you, the Oscar goes to Albert. <laughs> so I laughed, and, uh, but he's a great, he's a nice person too. Right? Nice. But I was disappointed. I had told everybody at my church. I called my friends in New York, you know, I, down in Florida. I said, oh, I got a speaking part in the Steven Spielberg movie, Mr. Uh, Lincoln, you know. Right, right. And lo and behold, when the film came out, they had edited the entire scene out. I think they edited it out simply because I think it was, it was dark, because we were shooting the scene at night. It's either that or either because it was too long, mm -hmm. the movie itself, because the movie itself is like two hours. Right, a very that's long right. Movie. Yes, yes. But uh, I think if they had left that scene in there, they would probably want more than <laughs> one or more. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> and then you mentioned, so about your memoir, and mm -hmm. I know, again, we met at a writing conference right. and we were talking right. about that. So tell us what this memoir, this is exciting. Tell us what this memoir is going to be all about. Well, it's about my life you know, growing up here in Virginia yeah. during the Jim Crow days, you know, uh, being called the N-word, having to travel so far to go to school, going to school with holes in the bottom of my shoes, you know, um, and it was just, it was just, uh, you know, rough times, you know, and plus my family at that time, back in the 1950s, 1940s, we didn't have running water or electricity. I remember lying on the floor in front of an old wood-burning stove, and I would, you know, would do my homework by the light coming from the wood-burning stove. And, um, and I remember during the summertime, when I was a young teenager, I remember the good humor man would come by with ice cream. So all the kids in my neighborhood, we would gather up our little coins and uh, wait for the good humor man to come. So uh, my sister, who really uh, is the one that raised me after my mother died, I was only one year and 11 months old when my mother died. So my sister dropped out of school to take care of me, so it's between her and my father. They, they took, the family, took care of me when I was young. Um, and we used to ask the good humor man, you have any extra ice cream? He had a big old blocks of ice on that good humor truck, right? And sometimes he would give us a block of ice and uh, we, we had an ice pick, you know, and pick, and pick, uh, pick the ice apart, you know. Yes. But uh, we talked talk about that. Now, we used to have to, we didn't have running water, so we had to take our clothes down to a spring, a nearby spring. Um, which, which was part of Neapsico Creek, mm. you know, which goes under Route 1. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and speaking of Route 1, <laughs> I talk about this in my book, where now I had to walk um, from Bethel Road, which was changed to Smoketown Road. And then they changed it from Smoketown Road to Neapsico Mules Road. But when I was walking down, when it was Bethel Road, uh, I remember walking down the road in order to catch a school bus, and we had to walk up the kids. It's about eight or nine of us, the young kids. So we had to walk to catch a school bus, because like I said, we weren't allowed to ride on the school bus with the white kids. So one day, this is amazing, I write about this in my book, and I tell people about it, they crack up about it. I, one, of, uh, one of my buddy, a buddy of mine in the group of us, we were about 13, 14 years old, um, <laughs> The white, the, the, the white kids would run by us and they would put the window down, they would call us the N-word, they would spit on us and everything. So one day, uh, my buddy, and I won't, I won't call his name right now, 
but he um, he decided to buy some penny candy in a paper bag. But there was a grocery, there was a little country store in route in our route on our way to the school bus. So he went to the country store and bought some penny candy, like Mary Jane, Tootsie Roll, mm -hmm. the Horn of Plenty, or whatever, all penny candy. So he emptied that the candy out of the bag, out of that brown paper bag, put the candy in his pocket, and he went behind a bush, and he peed in that brown paper bag. <laughs> so when that bus, we knew what time that, that school bus with the white kids was going to come by. So he peed in that brown paper bag and folded up. When that, white, when that school bus came by with those white kids on it, and they put their window down and started calling us the N-word. My brother that had peed in the brown paper bag, he threw that bag of pee and hit that little white boy right in the face. From that day on, they kept that window up. You know, but they always did this you know, and stuck the tongue out. But they never put that window down again. You know. but that was, wow. And we was only we were walking you know, on, on our way to school to catch the yeah. school bus, you yeah. know, because we were not we're not allowed to ride on the you know, white school bus. And plus uh, even when I started going to Genevieve High School, there was a high school right down, the, almost down, I and walking distance from where I live, Garfield, Garfield oh, High School. Right. I'm not talking about the new Garfield High School because it was in a, at another location prior to moving to where it is now. Oh. But where, where it was first, where it first originated, uh, which was on Cardinal Drive, now known as Cardinal Drive, it, that building now I think is called the uh, A.J. Falazzo Building. It's the government building. Okay. That used to be where the, the Garfield High School was. Wow. wow. So, but that's, I, it was in walking distance from me, but I was not allowed to go there. I had to go all the way to Manassas. Wow. <laughs> and I remember when we met, one of the things that you said about your memoir that you want to accomplish from it is showing how whites and blacks can work together. Oh, yes. Yeah. And yeah. Yes. Like I told, about I told yeah. a, a columnist last Two, uh, two weeks ago, I was telling him about it. I said because when my when I, my my father my father's house burnt down when it burnt down he was in the, in the fifth year late 1950s house burnt down and um, there was a white man named Mr. Harry Turrell T Y R R E L L Mr. Turrell Harry Turrell him and my father were like brothers very close. So when, when our house burnt down, Mr. Turrell contacted my father and said, uh, uh, Shaq, my, everybody called my father Shaq, S-H-A-C-K, Shaq, but his real name was Charles. Okay. And uh, Harry came over and said, Shaq, you know, your house burnt down. He said, listen, I'm building a house over on Featherstone Road. If you can get someone to come over there and tear those cinder blocks down, you can have those cinder blocks and rebuild them. So me and my brother, my brother had a 52, 52 Ford, and we made so many trips over there getting those, taking down those old cinder blocks and rebuild. I got pictures of that old, that old cinder block house. And Mr. And Mr. Harry Turrell is the one that gave us those cinder blocks to rebuild. Not only did Mr. Turrell and his wife Julie, Julia uh, Turrell, they were good people. And I tell you, if it hadn't been for Mr. Harry Turrell and Julia Turrell, Terrell, I don't think I would have finished school because at least once a month they would drive up in our driveway, my family's driveway, with boxes of clothes, you know, uh, socks, underwear, t-shirts, uh, pencil, notebooks and everything, and bring it up there for me to go to school. Wow. You know, wow. they, they were wonderful people, wonderful people. Wow, and I think that's so <clears throat> important for people to know because the time that you come from, things were very, very hard for oh, black people. Oh yes, yeah. But here you're saying, <coughs> even with all of the hardship, there was still there was we good still, We still could get that, along. Yes. Right. Now that was a, a, that, the Weeks. The Weeks family was very well known here in Prince William County. The Weeks family. Also the Hedges. I mean, uh, the, the Hedges. I think they have a street called Hedges Run or something. Name that, Mr. Hedges. Mr. Hedges was a real big, tall man. I talk about him in my book. He was a real big, tall man with a long white beard. He looked, reminded me of like a Paul Bunyan or somebody. Yes. But um, me and my brother, when we were teenagers, we just steal chickens from him. <laughs> <laughs> he lived right up the street from us. But, uh, but, and he made some good homemade cider too. But, uh, but, but and then there's, a, then there's another, another family, another white family, um, Doc Hampton. Marina down at Lisa Park. 
Hmm. And my, he, he would let my father have credit at his grocery store. He had a little country store. So my sister would go there and get, buy, get food whenever my father had that deal paid up, mm -hmm. you know, and everything. Mm -hmm. But he was a good man. In fact, uh, him and his wife, he, he had two daughters and one son. And it was the nicest they could be, very nice. Wow. They treated me very well. Man. So what would your message be for people today? Well, my message for people today, I re like I was telling um, a journalist a couple of weeks ago, I was telling him, I said, you know, Quite a few years ago, there was a man in California, I think his name was Rodney King, who was yes. beaten by uh, some cops. Yes. And what happened was that he went on national t television and said, can't we just get along? Yes, sir. Can't we just get along? And I said to myself, I said, I, right now I'm saying it that we can. Mm -hmm. We may have our differences, but we can get along, you know. Yes, sir. We have to learn to respect each other's differences. Now, I was watching something the other night. I was watching that, um, the Speaker of the House. That man, Je Jeffries, made an outstanding, I'll never forget it as long as I did, uh, live, you know. But we can get along, you know, and I, and I know we can. Because yes, I've, I've, I've been there, I've been through it, you know. Yes. And I had, there was a, there was a white, there was the weeks, getting, uh, speaking of the weeks, that was um, one of the weeks uh, was a very good friend of my father. In fact, my, uh, he moved, in, moved into my own house, moved into the house with my father because they both liked drinking. They were big drinkers of beer and wine <laughs> and, and smoking cigars, you know. And so I came down from New York one, one, one weekend, and uh, my, bro my oldest brother was there, and I said, I said what's going on, jo uh, Charles? He said, I got to get Mr. Cigar, Bud, uh, Bud Cigar, that was his name, Bud Cigar, white man. He said, he done, got, he done moved in here, and he, I don't know, he, and he got a dog out there in the old car and everything. <laughs> and, the, you know, these are country folks, you know. But Bud Cigar and, uh, Bud Cigar, I think his real name was, the last name, I think it was a Weeks. Uh, some kin to Gordon Weeks. But uh, they were like brothers. They got along very well, you know, very, very well. And then there were two brothers that lived right down the street from me. I called them the Bland brothers. They used to give me comic books when they see me walking mm -hmm. to school or mm -hmm. coming from the school bus. Mm -hmm. They would give me uh, like Dick Tracy and uh, some other comic books they would give me. And to me, you know, you sharing your story, it, it really says to me, kindness mm -hmm. really doesn't have a color, right? No, no it doesn't. No.